Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm super excited. This is the first time in four years that the Hunger Mountain Co-op has uh, hosted a dinner and discussion. So um, it's already a success and we haven't even had the presentation yet. So this is fabulous. Yeah, all of us. So, the Hunger Mountain Co-op Council and the Council's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee are pleased to present our first dinner and discussion since 2019. Um, first, I want to thank the Montpelier Senior Activity Center for making this space available. And uh, thanks to the Co-op Community Relations staff uh, Stephanie, Jess, and Robin, and member owner services staff, Rowan, and, um, and Ellie um, from HR, um, for doing everything to uh, pull all the pieces together tonight. Um, thanks also to Orca Media for uh, the microphone and the visuals and recording all this tonight. Um, um, I'm looking forward to watching the Zoom when I'm not thinking about all the other things later. Uh, thanks to Abby Jaffe uh, representing um, the Everything Space and providing information and resources on my grandmother's hand study group. And the Vermont Kindness Project, Shonda Williams and Kimberly Pierce. Uh, so tonight we have invited uh, young BIPOC women and LGBTQIA plus farmers and food producers to speak with us about their experiences. Our goal is to learn from our community how to best support underrepresented farmers and food producers in our community with the intention of having a lasting impact on council and co-op practices and policies. Uh, and I uh, want to introduce Desmond uh, Peoples. Um, Desmond, can you raise your hand? There you are. Desmond is a writer living in Underhill and working in communications and exhibit curating for the Vermont Arts Council. Desmond formed and facilitates the Arts Council's Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Advisory Network. Desmond also serves on the board of Out in the Open, a Brattleboro-based nonprofit organizing and advocating <coughs> organizing and advocating for rural LGBTQ plus people. Take it away, Desmond. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so. The way tonight is going to work, we're gonna have our four presenters speak to you one by one. I'll introduce them. And then after each speaks, we'll have them sit over at this table here and we'll have a Q&A portion. So at that point, I'll bring the mic out to people who wanna ask questions. So um, we asked each presenter to consider a few points uh, as they speak. And those are, how did you get to where you are in your business? What are your goals and how are you pursuing them? What does community support look like to you? And if that's not what you see, how could the co-op be part of your community support? So we're going to start with Nurbu Sherpa of Sherpa Foods. Nurbu Sherpa is originally from Nepal, a small Himalayan country in Southeast Asia. Nurbu and his wife Fura moved to Vermont and started Sherpa Foods in 2015. They make and supply Nepalese foods such as momos, which are Nepalese dumplings, chow mein, which is Himalayan style fried noodles, Himalayan style fried rice, and momo sauce. Nurbu. If you want to like stand around, you can use yeah. this mic, but there's a here. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Hungerman Co op team, the Jedi, and everyone else. Uh, for having me here, we really appreciate it. Uh, as Desmond, thank you Desmond and Eva as well. <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, my name is Nurbu Sherpa. Uh, I have a, a food supply business called Sherpa Foods. 
Uh, and again, uh, he mentioned everything about what we supply, so I don't need to go through that again. Um, so, we, uh, so I'm from Nepal, uh, as you mentioned, a small Himalayan uh, nation, you know, uh, in Southeast Asia between India and China. Um, we moved here uh, when I was young. I went to school in Texas, graduated from University of Texas, and got a job offer from Macy's and moved to New York City. Uh, worked there for about 10 years, uh, doing different um, uh, work. You know, I was a buyer, a uh, marketing manager, a business manager, and such. And then in 2014, uh, we moved up here in uh, Vermont uh, and uh, started our business uh, in 2015. Um, so we initially started out in at the uh, farmers market in Burlington, uh, and then. Um, you know, we started um, sampling and demoing and, and doing other things uh, at the farmer's market and uh, started getting into some accounts uh, like the city market, healthy living, a Hunger Mountain co-op, uh, Middlebury co-op. So these four stores, you know, we have a very, very, you know, a, a, a lot of love for these stores because, you know, that's the kind of like the foundation that we, we, you know, started on. So we really appreciate the support. Hunger Mountain team, really, really we do. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, we've been uh, 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 we've been very fortunate to receive that kind of support from our customers, our store partners, uh, and you know, everyone else uh, to to help us grow and uh, to bring us where we are so far. Um, uh, right now, we supply our products in uh, New England region. Uh, we just got into Whole Foods just now, like a couple of months ago. So we're really excited about that. So we. Our goal uh, is to go further, you know, um, uh, New England, further, you know, Connecticut, Hudson Valley, New York, you know, for just going to East Coast and then hopefully take over the nation down the road. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But that's our hope and dreams and goals for the for the future. But we're just working, you know, s slowly, one step at a time, because um, you know, when you have a small business, uh, you try to grow too fast and sometimes you you fail. So you know, you got to make sure. You know, you're you're chewing. Uh, you know, you're biting. You know, what you can chew. You know, you can't do that more than more than you can you can chew. So, um, uh, and along the way, uh, I feel like what you know, um, Desmond was saying earlier about the support from the community. You know, we. Um, I feel like we couldn't have been uh, where we are if we had started in a different state. Let's say in New York City. You know, if I was in New York and we tried to start this business in New York, I don't think you know would have been, you know, where we are because. Uh, I don't feel like the support that we received here from, you know, customers, you know, uh, about the local businesses, you know, and, and minority-owned business, it was amazing for us, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, we we like to thank the you know, the whole community here, uh, you know, um, all the people that that supported in the in the beginning when we were first coming out. And the funny thing is, when we first you know started our business, um, a lot of people didn't know what what Mom was where because it was a very New products, you know, all together. Uh, so it was really tough in the beginning. Try to educate what momos were, you know, how you know how it was supposed to be eaten, you know, what it's made of, you know, <laughs> all of these different things, you know. Uh, yeah, do you eat momos with soy? You know, we got a lot of questions like that, and we had to answer, you know, no, you know, momos are usually eaten with tomato uh, you know, sauce, you know, and you know we supply our sauce also to go with it, you know. So it was, in the beginning, it was a little tough uh, for the first couple of years, uh, but you know, again, uh, with the support that, that we received from, from all the uh, customers, the store partners, you know, we were really thankful that, that we started our business here. And uh, the one thing that, that I, I, I do feel, uh, and, and it's um, my perspective, our perspective, the business you know, that we, when we started, uh, the opportunity that I that I see is uh, in the financial side and the uh, um, governmental, and I guess you know the agencies, you know, because um, when when we moved here, uh, we had no idea about. I mean, we had no networks, no connections, you know, we had no um, no idea about actually, you know, how to start a food business. Basically, uh, I was in retail, you know, I was at Macy's for about ten years, but that's a whole different ball game. You know, food industry is a whole different thing. I didn't know that, you know, when I first started, I thought, you know, hey, you know, let's start a business, you know, how hard could it be? But then I started realizing, you know, one step at a time, there's, you know, there's like this permit and that permit, and then, you know, USDA, FDA, you know, uh, health department, HACCP, you know, I had no idea what HACCP was, 
so it was just learning process, you know. Uh, so I think there's opportunity in, in that sector, in that section, you know, uh, when not only actually, I mean, every startup, you know, has difficulty, you know, getting off the ground, uh, but I feel like minority, you know, BIPOC um, folks, you know, I think, has even more, you know, uh, uh, issues or, or problems that they face when they when they are, you know, getting their business off the ground. Uh, I mean, we had some savings of our own um, that we had saved up from our work. Uh, my wife used to work at uh, the JFK, you know, uh, at a cargo division. Uh, so we bootstrapped this whole business uh, when we first started. When we, uh, I still remember, you know, I went to an, uh, a bank uh, to get some loan and. They almost kind of laughed at me, <laughs> and they said, you know, maybe you come back in a, like four or five years, you know, <laughs> when you're really, you know. And I understand, I understand their point of view, and I understand where they're coming from. You know, food business, you know, restaurant business is not, it's not easy, you know. And they, you know, majority of them fail, you know, in the first couple of years. I understand that, but yeah, there's the opportunity, you know, in supporting uh, new startup, uh, you know, new folks that are getting into any type of business. Uh, finding that resource of, of kind of you know uh, funding uh, or even like just a mentor uh, finding some mentors you know uh, on how to access those uh, resources or fundings and things like that I think that would be very helpful uh, for a new startups so that's one of my things that I've been trying to do uh, you know trying to share my experience with people that are uh, starting up uh, new businesses, you know, whatever I could do, um, uh, I, you know, just sharing my experience, you know, telling them who they should contact, you know, where should they go and things like that. So, you know, um, those are the opportunities that I feel like that's out there for uh, uh, new startups, BIPOC, minority, you know, uh, all of that. So that's... Uh, what I feel, that's what I think. <laughs> and again, uh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you very much, Nurbu. Next, I'd like to introduce Ariel Krolik of Ariel's Honey. Ariel Krolik has owned Ariel's Honey Infusions for 12 years. She handcrafts 16 unique honey infusions using only sustainably harvested raw Vermont honey infused together with local organic herbs. Ariel is passionate about spreading understanding and awareness about the vital role bees play in keeping the planet healthy. Ariel, come on up. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. I am not really used to talking in front of people. I'm usually around bees and plants and I work by myself and it's just me. So this is kind of pushing me out of my comfort zone a little bit, but I'm really excited to be here and want to thank all of you for having me. Um, yeah, I've been in business for 12 years. Um, I am in business by myself I don't have um, a staff or a partner. It's just myself. I do everything. Literally, I go and deliver to co-ops. I meet with buyers. I go to stores. I make products. I work online and design my website. I design labels. I mean, everything you can think of with a business, I do. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, on, on the flip side, I also run a, a landscaping business. And so right now is a really crazy time for me. Um, I build pollinator gardens. So I always tell people I kind of cross-pollinate businesses. Um, I started doing the landscaping business before the honey business. And it was kind of this passion where I was seeing people really interested in wanting to make gardens to bring more pollinators to their house and what can they do, what can they do with their kids and their family. So I was a teacher at the time and I needed a summer job and I was always a gardener so I started this business and um, when I finished teaching I started the honey business. It, they kind of crossed over um, because I really enjoy connecting people to what's going on in in their garden and with bees coming into their life. And instead of just people being afraid of bees, I wanted to 
have them understand what they were doing for all of us. So I really, I started making these honey infusions, which are, which are basically raw honey straight from the hive. Um, and no sprays or pesticides are used on the hives or the farms or the bees at all. And then I work with organic um, herb flower growers through Vermont and I mix the herbs and the spices with the honey and the longer they sit, it kind of changes the flavor. Um, medicinally, they're amazing for cold season, but you can use them on food, you could just eat them. I'm usually covered in honey, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm around it all the time. But basically, I took two businesses and tried to make them both work together. Um, and during that, I just sort of decided I'm gonna try to educate people as much as I possibly can about what we can do to keep bees alive. Because as I've been growing both businesses, I've been seeing a really big decline with bees, like really, really big, where I go to a garden and I used to see bumblebees and now I maybe see one. Um, and so with both businesses, they kind of keep cross-pollinating each other, where I'm talking to people and you know sharing knowledge about what bees are doing for us. And um, so as I talk about honey or go to stores, I'm also kind of mixing in the other talk about bees. Um, so I've been doing that for about 12 years. Um, one of the questions that was asked of me was, how did I get to where I am? And really, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of like falling on my face and getting back up again. Um, but all of these co-ops that have taken me on from the get-go, just going in, introducing myself, tasting honey, hearing my story, have been amazing and just kind of kept me going along the way. Um, as well as just growing and meeting other beekeepers and connecting with them and hearing their stories. There's not a lot of female beekeepers out there and maybe there are some in here today, maybe not. Um, so I'm always looking for like new beekeepers to connect with of all ages. Um, and some big goals of mine as I've been growing the business have always been how can I take control of doing, like not having rent or how can I just own everything instead of kind of having somebody else over me that I'm always trying to race to keep up and like have to pay, pay that rent, pay this, pay that. And my long-term goal has always been, I'm gonna someday find a piece of land and build a little honey house and, you know, have bees and plant these gardens and, and have my own business out of that space and have like a little haven that is for bees and myself and people can come to and learn there um, and starting last summer I I took this on and I started building um, a honey office um, my partner and I have been living on a piece of land for about seven years and we're at the point where I was ready to build this office and for the past year that's what I've been doing um, I guess what I mean like I've been building, like literally, I've put in the electricity, put in the plumbing, put in the foundation, everything um, from ground up. And uh, it's been so much work, but the payoff's been unbelievable for me. And my long-term goal is to just keep trying to have bees stay alive there, keep trying to bring good honey to people and educating, you know, kids especially, because kids are so important right now for keeping bees alive and just like letting them know that they're not, you know, gonna, not really gonna hurt us. We might get stung once in a while, but um, they're really keeping all of our co-ops and us going. Because without bees, we, we really wouldn't have the co-op, we wouldn't have food. Um, we wouldn't have plants, we wouldn't have all of these blossoms that are so beautiful. Um, so it's just a constant thing that I'm always working on and trying to, I don't know, figure out how community can get involved with me to, to keep that going in a positive direction. Um, 
I do definitely have struggles as a small business owner, um, not necessarily because I'm female, but um, money is always a factor. I think that um, when you're a small business and you're trying to figure out how to do everything and pay bills and have a life, um, you're trying to balance out all these things. It's really hard to sit down and like write a grant, for instance. Like, I don't have time to write a grant. Like, I don't even really have time to like just have fun. So I'm like constantly in this balance of like life work. And um, it's not easy. And COVID definitely like was challenging. Um, but I'm trying to figure out as a small business owner, like how I can ask for help and um, what that looks like and who would be the right person to do that. Um, and just, yeah, how to, to, to figure it out. And really for me to be able to, to build the Honey Office that I created, it was just work, a lot of work. I didn't take out any grants or loans. I've done it all myself. And it's just, you know, that constant work all the time. Um, so I guess that would be one thing looking to community for people that have extra time or resources to, to sit down with, you know, these small businesses that are just working so hard to like give suggestions or help out with things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm just, re I'm really thankful for the community that I have and all the people that have supported me along the way. Um, yeah, I just, I have a really big passion for, for bees and I hope that through my product, um, when people taste it, they kind of get like a new vision of, you know, the, all the beautiful things that bees do for us and just kind of keep building on that over time. But um, yeah, I'm just thankful for the community and the co-ops and all the people that I work with. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel. Next up, we have Jonah Mossberg of Milkweed Farm. Jonah Mossberg is a queer trans farmer who lives in Westminster West. Jonah has been working in agriculture for almost 20 years and has run Milkweed Farm since 2017. The farm is a diversified no-till vegetable, flower, and pear operation with a focus on growing high-quality, nutrient-dense food. Jonah is most excited about making compost, mushrooms, and his two wild farm kids. Come on up, Jonah. All right, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Jonah Mossberg. I run Milkweed Farm down in Westminster West, so we're down south, not exactly part of this food shed exactly, so we appreciate um, the invitation up here and opportunity to, to speak. Um, I run the farm with my wife, Emily Hartz, and it is our seventh season of, of Milkweed Farm. We grow, we're, yeah, diversified vegetable flower operation. Um, we inherited this lovely uh, pear, mostly Asian pear orchard on our farm. And um, we grow organically, though we're not certified organic. We use organic standards. We meet or exceed them on our farm. Um, we're small. We grow on just over an acre. I think I counted the other day, and we have like one, about 100, 100 foot beds. And, and in that space, and a bunch of greenhouses included in that, and in that space, we run a 75 member CSA of our own. We also sell 30 shares worth of food to our farm partners at Wild Carrot Farm in Brattleboro. That's a cool partnership we've had with them for about five years, kind of supplementing their CSA. Um, so we feed about 100 families throughout the season. We sell to our local co-op, the Putney Co-op, and we do a little bit of wholesale through a local food hub sometimes, um, but mostly, mostly CSA. Um, 
yeah, we're a queer and trans-led farm. And for us, it's like all about community. We work really hard to give away food to our local food shelf whenever possible. We work with the NOFA Farm Share program to give subsidized shares to folks who otherwise wouldn't normally be able to afford them. We give shares away to queer, BIPOC, disabled elders um, as much as possible. We also grow uh, seeds. We grow shishito pepper seeds, if you're fam familiar with that. Um, pepper, it's an excellent frying pepper. And we grow that seed for uh, True Love Seed Company. If you don't know them, you should check them out. They're this amazing like farmer-led seed company that's mostly, most of the growers are queer or BIPOC folks, um, kind of Philadelphia-based. <coughs> True Love Seeds. Um, so yeah, it's a busy time for us right now. Um, we have a lot going on on the farm. And I guess the question of like, how did we get to where we are and what are what are the goals of the farmer kind of like I'm going to answer that all at once they're all kind of tied up in each other um, so yeah I've been working on farms for about 20 years I'm 37 now I started when I was like 18 19 working on farms and so for the longest time for me the goal was yeah sure can't hear me yeah is that better Okay, so for me, for the longest time, the, the goal was to have a long-term land base for the farm, to buy a farm, um, and last year that happened. Um, yeah, the dream came true. <clears throat> um, yeah, after literal decades of saving, and you know, I really, it's a whole another long story about how we, we got the farm and the process of, of buying it. Um, I could write a book about how uh, strained and difficult that process was, but we did it, and um, so, we're, so we're there. So that, that goal has been achieved. And <laughs> uh, now moving forward with our farm, um, not only do we want to continue to grow really good food for our community, um, and sort of, like this year we're just kind of like, our first year on the land we're kind of just like stabilizing our business in a lot of pretty big ways working on big infrastructure projects capital improvements um, chipping away at stuff like fencing and irrigation and rebuilding greenhouses and fixing things so it, things just kind of are a more well-oiled machine so we're that's sort of like a short-term um, goal kind of more present and then in the long term with our farm our vision now is basically to, uh, to use the land to actually incubate other businesses, other farmers who are young, beginning farmers, BIPOC farmers, queer farmers, farmers that you might not, or people who you might not normally think of as um, like your typical farmer, kind of like how we are. There's not a ton of queer people or trans people that I know that are farmers. There's definitely some of us, but we're not like your uh, average uh, farmer population. When I go to farmer conferences, there's not usually a lot of other queer people there, just to be real, sometimes there are, but not generally speaking. So we wanna use our land base now to sort of create a, a place where other people can incubate their businesses, so giving folks not only like access to the actual physical land to do that, but access to water, to greenhouse space, sort of all of the things that you need, like setting people up, you know, with all the things that you need to be successful, um, and additionally taking it one step further, um, we want to be able to buy all of the food that the folks that we're incubating, that they're producing. So buy it for our CSA, buy it for a future farm store that we're gonna build. That way we're sort of taking the marketing piece and the sort of like, difficulty with marketing out of the picture for people who are just starting because for me that's always marketing is always the hardest part of farming like you can grow the most beautiful stuff but if you can't get it to market or get it into the co-ops or get it to, to people to eat it then it kind of doesn't matter um, and your work is all f for naught um, so yeah it's like I think about that stuff a lot in farming we just Farmers have to wear so many hats, and I really can't think of any other profession 
um, kind of like what you were saying, um, it's just like, you have to be an electrician, a plumber, a mechanic, sometimes an engineer. Um, you have to know how to grow your product well, if you're raising animals or flowers or vegetables or whatever. Um, did I say mechanic, carpenter? There's so many other things that you have to do in order to be successful in farming. So, oh, also a bookkeeper, um, and then being able to like successfully market your crop. So with the incubation, um, idea that's sort of like removing that from the whole equation for people and just giving folks like an established market to step right into as they're building their business. Um, other goals for us are like having retirement accounts that we contribute to. Um, <laughs> it's real. Uh, and yeah, and then how do we pursue our goals? I mean, we work really hard every damn day during the season. Um, and in the off season, we revisit our business plan and we look back at our records to make observations and projections for the next season. Um, so always like revisiting those documents um, and going back to the numbers and running the numbers and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Um, uh, yeah, what else? Let's see, community support. Um, so I've, I had a farmer once say to me that, um, and it rang so true, that uh, it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes an entire community to have a sustainable food source. And to me, that's just like straight to the heart. And like I said in the beginning for us, we farm because of community. And for us, we landed on CSA because for us, it's sort of the best way we've felt or like the most fitting way that we've been able to build relationships with folks. We've done farmer's markets, we've sold to restaurants, we've done a bunch of different stuff with farming and all of those things are cool. If you do markets, that's totally cool, but we've found that our relationships with our CSA customers tend to be like a little bit less superficial than what you find at the farmer's market. Um, and uh, so we've actually moved our farm two times now before we bought our before we bought our farm, we had two kind of um, like really difficult short-term land leases with difficult landowners um, that both ended pretty poorly, unfortunately. And so we have now twice moved all of our greenhouse, like, you know, built and rebuilt greenhouses and moved them. We've moved all of our farm stuff. It's, uh, it's extreme. And we didn't do it alone. We literally had 40 friends with 80 arms show up on two separate times to help us do that. And there's no other way that we could have made it happen um, without, without that kind of mutual aid. So that's what community support looks like for us. Um, yeah, for real. And, uh, and the, and just like another detail to throw in there in terms of community support, the, the food hub that we sell to, they showed up last time we moved um, in March in ice and snow with their big rig truck and helped us move all of our greenhouse materials instead of like truckload by tr pickup truckload. Um, so that was just like completely amazing and we were so grateful. Um, and then also just little things like community support to me kind of looks like a $50 bill that happened last week where I went into the co-op in Putney to sell them some greens. It was like a small sale, so they paid me in cash. Or here's a $50 bill. And then it was Mother's Day, and I went back in the co-op and bought my wife some chocolate, and that $50 bill was still in my pocket. And I was like, oh, let's just recirculate you know, this money in the local economy. Um, and it was just kind of this like small thing that really wasn't so small at all, actually. Um, I don't know. I guess I'll. I guess I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jonah. And our last presenter is Arantha Farrow of Caledonia Cannabis. Arantha is deeply committed to cultivating authentic, connected, and reciprocal relationships with the aspects of life on this amazing planet. 
Her love of agriculture took a deep dive about six years ago when she and her family began to homestead in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. She opened Caledonia Cannabis in 2018, which endured the global pandemic. Her passion for inclusivity is the driving force of her work. Arantha. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today with all of you and really honored to be on this panel alongside, alongside these amazing people I'm hearing about today. Um, yeah, so I started in the CBD industry in 2018. Me and a friend grew some plants. Um, and I basically uh, got to know a lot of the state of Vermont and a lot of people who were also interested in that industry because I was working alongside others trying to form uh, a grower's co-op for, for uh, cannabis in Vermont understanding that um, you know it's a lot to do everything by oneself and um, you know to work together with community uh, makes everything a lot simpler and there's people who just want to grow plants and then there's people who maybe just want to uh, market plants or um, yeah make products and so anticipating all of this, uh, I basically just started talking to a bunch of people and going to different events um, and talking to other Vermonters about forming a co-op. I also had had some experience uh, at other farms um, out in uh, California and Oregon at the time. So I kind of knew a bit more about the process than some of the uh, people alongside of me who are also jumping into it. So it quickly turned into me also being able to share with people information about, you know, starting with seeds or with clones and then where to get them and then, and then all of that. So. Um, yeah, that's how it started. And then the following year after opening my company and uh, turning what I had grown into product, I, um, I got approached by a big investor to uh, manage a big proj project for them. And I was just, I had just opened my company and was really excited about it. And there was all this momentum and we were at the hemp conference and we had all these different products and me and my friend, like it was, I don't know, it was a lot of fun, but, um, and it felt really like, everything felt really glorious and possible and beautiful. Um, and then I decided to take this job for these investors, he approached me, they approached me in April and um, I took the job not because I really wanted to, uh, a company that I was a part of, I thought would represent that scale of a grow. They wanted to grow 50 or 100 acres in Vermont as, as much as they could. Um, but I thought that if I align myself with those kind of resources, um, then I could, and I was managing like the drying machines, then I could turn to my neighbor and be like, hey, there's a slot in the drying machines and like these problems that we were seeing in the industry might be able to be resolved through aligning with that kind of um, resources. So anyways, they said they were gonna pay me $50,000 to uh, manage uh, this project. I was 26 years old, um, I met him in April, uh, it started by me just like putting quotes together of like, okay, how much is the dirt? Like, it just kind of like rolled into it was happening. Like he was like, so how much is all the dirt cost? And how much would the trays be? And how much, and so I was like making these spreadsheets and then all of a sudden he's like, okay, so where are we gonna do it? And what's, and so anyways, we did it. Um, we did this huge project. It was really complicated and messy in a lot of ways, but it happened. Um, but then unfortunately he didn't pay me. And so I, um, I realized, <laughs> yeah, I realized in, I, re I just started to realize that I wasn't gonna get paid for it after working all summer. So I was just, I kind of just like walked away from it after the season in December. I moved down to New York City and I began, uh, this is like December in 2019, and I began uh, talking to all these store owners and talking to them about all the farmers up in Vermont and all this amazing, Vermont organic flour that people are growing and all the products and all the different people that I knew. 
and beginning to uh, bridge, bridge this connection between Vermont CBD and New York City, Manhattan storefronts and all of that. They, at the time, uh, were getting stuff from Colorado, um, didn't have those kind of connections with Vermont. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And so uh, I got my stuff and I got on a train and I went back up to my mom's cabin and I did the thing we all did and hunkered down. And uh, me and my friend Fern decided that we should grow a lot of food um, because who, know, who knew what was happening with the world. So we grew a bunch of food. Um, sorry, I guess I'm just going on this like whole story of what, <laughs> what happened. But um, anyways, basically, uh, in a lot of ways, my uh, experience in the industry has been tumultuous. And um, yeah, I ended up, uh, I'm ending up right now kind of standing on the precipice of deciding if I'm going to continue to move deeper into the cannabis industry in the state of Vermont as it goes into recreational THC. Um, I do understand that I think people, uh, I think that a lot of where the real medicine at is at is, is when it's, there's a balance between CBD and THC. And so I anticipate a lot of CBD only companies getting squashed out by THC licensed people because they'll be able to play with the ratios, whereas a CBD only uh, person will get stopped um, at a certain point. I was always kind of more interested into the in the broader scale like uh, CBD part of the plant. Um, and I'm really ultra, ultimately interested in like industrial hemp and hemp for clothing and plastic and oil. Um, I think that cannabis is an amazing plant ally to all of us and has been kind of like keeping us paying attention to it for a really long time. And uh, if we were able to work alongside it right now in these moments, um, it could help us solve a lot of these global crises we have um, in our hands. But yeah, so um, somewhere along the lines, I ended up getting throwing everything uh, into getting a trolley. Um, which is like, it's like a, it's like a, it looks like a, it drives like a bus, but it looks like a trolley, which is like, um, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a pretty bus uh, with, with like, it's some places they do, it's like in San Francisco sometimes, or like they'll do tours with the trolley. It's kind of a funny thing to describe. Um, in Vermont, there's not really that many trolleys, but, um, but I, after, um, yeah, after New York City and everything just shut down, it it came up as this solution for um, for retail, for retailing, uh, mobile retail. And so, um, yeah, the trolley has in the last few years become a huge part of my life. I'm like constantly working on the trolley, or like, <laughs> like I don't know, I'm renovating this old trolley, um, and uh, that's been a journey and. Um, but yeah, now it seems like a lot of the things that I've been doing or the ideas that I've had with all of this have kind of been like one step, like I was like talking about co-ops, but they hadn't legislatively gotten there yet. And I'm, I'm thinking about like mobile retail, but it hasn't really been a thing quite yet for cannabis. So, so yeah, now I'm in this moment uh, of reevaluating just all things. And after a really tragic year, Fern ended up, ended up dying and uh, being, yeah, that's, um, but uh, I just had a really hard year and just stopped doing everything kind of. Um, and now, um, now I'm deciding what I'm gonna do. And if I'm gonna keep going with this, what I'm sorry, what I've been working on for a while. Um, yeah, my dad is from Zimbabwe and I grew up in, he was deported when I was four uh, for cannabis related racial profiling things uh, from Vermont. So I grew up in Vermont with my mom's side of the family and have always been trying to go see my dad in Zimbabwe. And I just did that. Um, and I just got back like a few weeks ago and I saw my dad and I saw my family. And in some ways, I think that um, the timing of it is kind of rerouting my trajectory. So to be quite honest, I don't know what, what, how much my involvement will continue to be in the Vermont 
cannabis industry. Um, but I do know that Vermont has um, a wonderful, strong backbone community of farmers and good people who, uh, who need uh, community support um, to stay afloat. I feel passionate about the people who grow our food and grow our medicine to have homes with roofs that are sturdy and <laughs> to be able to support themselves and feel strong and, um, and supported because, um, yeah, farming and agriculture is the most, is one of the most important, important things um, in the world. And I think, um, and yeah, it's been a while since I spoke in front of a lot of people. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just like emotionally in some ways all over the place, but I do really appreciate being here. Um, and yeah, I think that we're gonna have questions, which maybe I'll be able to answer those in a more concise way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arantha, and thank you to all our presenters. Get to have a round of applause for everybody. So yeah, now, now all of our speakers will be sitting over there. Um, do we have two portable microphones? We do, great. Now it's on. So this, um, okay, is, we'll just wait for this to, to turn on. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so if you just like to, if you have a question, you'd like to raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Um, we also have questions coming in from Zoom. Um, when, when there is a question, would you like to raise your hand and we'll just turn to you? Great, thank you very much. All right, questions please for our speakers. Well, I'm Marit, I'm a member, and um, some of you have already uh, touched on this, but I'm wondering what, may, what helped you get through all the problems that came along with the pandemic? Um, I think this is on, but yeah. Um, I actually reached out to the community the most I ever have to other food folks. Um, and I started making boxes of different foods from different like companies and businesses and we started distributing them um, amongst the community. And that actually kept me and probably about 100 other vendors going through the pandemic and um, it really was an incredible thing. It, it pushed me in new ways and I got to meet so many different people. So that helped me get through along with a lot of other people. Um, is it possible to make that horrible humming stop? Anybody know how? Um, <coughs> for us, uh, things really didn't change that much. We actually had a banner year during COVID, um, the first year. Uh, we had already purchased most of our supplies by the time lockdown happened, so we were kind of just like business as usual, and our CSA was like sold out, sales through the roof, everywhere, all the time, food flying out the door, going like here, going there, people couldn't get enough of it. And um, so we kind of had a good time. I mean, it was tough. We stayed home a lot more than we usually do, but. Honestly, I don't get off the farm a whole lot in general, anyhow. So I, with the timing of me opening my company and the timing of the pandemic, 
wasn't actually able to um, get any like business support or I hadn't I wasn't quite a bit I wasn't quite established enough to um, I don't know I think the other businesses that I knew of in Vermont were getting support there's federal support for some businesses but because of the timing of me with uh, the pandemic happening um, it it just it was difficult and I I pivoted I pivoted and I stayed creative um, and I stayed hopeful um, but yeah so uh, you know March April when it first started uh, our sales dropped you know like most businesses you know suffered we suffered the same thing you know our businesses dropped in every store every account uh, and um, at that time, we only had uh, beef momos and vegan momos. So we only had two different flavors. And um, to make the you know, matter worse, uh, there, lo there were a lot of outbreaks you know, at uh, different processing meat processing plants. You know, so it was really, getting, you know, really hard getting you know, uh, beef at that point. And even if we get some, uh, uh, we're able to source some. You know, they were so expensive. So you, know, you couldn't afford it, basically. So at one point, you know, we... So we had to let everyone go, our you know, uh, staff at that point. It was just me and my wife and uh, our son at that, at that time. Just going into uh, our uh, uh, facility and just you know, doing whatever we, we could do at that time. Just working from 7, 8 in the morning. And then you know, we had Aiden because uh, he had uh, you know, online classes. So we had to make sure that he was taken care of also. And just cooking, making, whatever. And then after a month or so, you know, we started to realize that only one product was not gonna hold us over, because, uh, like I said, the sales in every stores were like dropping like rocks. So, uh, at that point, you know, me and my wife sat down and we thought about, you know, what's gonna happen in the next two or three months. You know, uh, we're trying to do our financial projections, and it seemed like we had to shut down in, in like a couple months because we didn't have enough, you know, revenue coming in. Uh, so at that time, you know, what we decided was to maybe, you know, we need to add more different flavors because, you know, the, the sales of the, uh, the beef product uh, were significantly, you know, down uh, from before. So we, you know, talked about, you know, different flavors, different um, uh, options. Uh, so what we did was we came up with uh, a chicken and pork flavor. It's too, too far. Close. Like this? Further, Further away? Yeah. Sorry, like this? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so, uh, so what we decided to do was to add more flavors uh, just to you know, uh, uh, offset the, the, the drop in sales of our, of our beef flavor. Um, so we started working with the USDA uh, and we asked for their help and said you know, we won't be able to you know, stay in business after two, three months if things you know, stayed the, the way it is. So they were very helpful at that point, you know. So they expedited some things. Uh, so we were able to get all the uh, labels and all the uh, formulation done, you know, in a couple of months. We also added uh, a vegan option, a vegan chow mein and vegan fried rice that we have right now, we, which we didn't have before pandemic. So <laughs> before the pandemic, we only have we had beef and vegan, and then we had our hot sauce. But after the uh, pandemic, you know, we had to pivot. We had to be creative. We had to do whatever we could to keep the business going because the business was our livelihood, you know. Uh, it was our kids' livelihood, so we had, you know, we had no choice. We had no option, you know. So we added those four flavors, and then on top of that, what I did was I laid down the map of Vermont and I checked what stores we, you know, had you know, w were carrying our products and which stores didn't. And I got all the phone numbers of those stores and I started calling all these accounts in Vermont and I said, hey, you know. We're such and such, you know. We're from Sherpa Foods. We have such and such kind of product, you know. Can you give us a try? I'd like to some send some samples. So I started calling out, you know, giving out samples, emailing. Uh, so that went on for like a month, and uh, you know, I think we added more accounts during the pandemic, uh, the 2020, you know, than previous th the two years prior to that. I would say it was no, it was uh, actually there was no choice. It was I had to do it because the sales were just going down and down every month, every week, you know. Uh, so that was the only option. So we added four flavors, four more flavors. We added more accounts. And then, yeah, just to persevere, just, just kept going, just, you know, um, you know, just going in, working, you know, <laughs> 10, 12 hours a day, 
taking care of our son and then coming out and just hoping that it would go away, it would get better soon. And at one point, like I said, we almost had to shut down, but I'm glad that we stuck around and my wife, you know, I mean, she w has been such amazing, amazing, you know, uh, support, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, that's how we, we got through the pandemic. Thank you very much. More questions? Over here in the corner. Hi, <coughs> I'm Eric Jacobson. I, I was uh, previously on the council of the Hunger Mount Co-op. I have a specific question for Arantha. Um, you know, it, when you go into the cannabis stores, uh, the product that they're selling is, as you described, was really very much focused on THC, and, and the percentages of THC are so um, intense. For those of us who grew up in New York City buying uh, dime bags and nickel bags of cannabis at the band shell, you know, it's not the kind of thing maybe at our age now that we want to get into, sitting in front of a bong doogie, what, what is it, 35% or, or more? And when you go to the shops and you ask them, well, what about a more mild product, more integrative, there really is no interest. However, I did see recently in the seven days a report of um, Ben Cohen, of Ben and Jerry's, who mentioned that that's his interest, is a more mild integrative product. It was in the seven days, just a couple weeks ago. So there, I just want to encourage you uh, for a number of things that you said that you're totally on the right track. I think there is there, there are a lot of customers that would be interested in your approach, and I would just want to encourage you to continue and not give up. Yeah, well, that's why um, CBD flower. Um, CBD flower uh, is is kind of similar to I think what what weed used to be like more. Um, uh, I feel the same way that I and I think that's kind of why I was so interested in CBD and those properties of the plant um, because I I smoking for me uh, t t high straight high THC strains is like too much I don't f I don't feel like I can like go along with my day do the things that I have to do <laughs> it's just like so um, yeah it was amazing in New York City and stuff there was whole stores opening up of just CBD flour um, and I think that I think that people's interest in CBD flour surprised um, was surprising but yeah I haven't really been tuned in much with what's going on with the dispensaries I haven't been into very many dispensaries in Vermont to be honest or in general I haven't really been um, I've just been this past year especially just tr getting to Africa and um, just coming back and now just standing here and being like okay what am I gonna what am I doing um, but yeah so I don't know much about what the what the recreational selection is looking like but I can imagine that um, it's I, I can imagine that it's THC high THC focused um, which which I also can imagine doesn't necessarily feel accessible for a lot of us maybe so that's good thank you <laughs> thanks for reminding me over here question over here Hi, my question is directed at uh, Ariel. Um, if I understand correctly, honeybees are not native to this continent. Can you speak to the, uh, uh, to the degree that our pollinators are at risk, whether they be honeybees or native, and um, how great of a concern it is? Thank you. Um. So right now I know, sorry, I'm gonna try to leave it there and see if you can hear me, okay. Um, I know that there's a few bumblebees, right now they're on the extinction list. It doesn't mean they're extinct yet, but they're getting close to being extinct. Um, and that's for Vermont honeybees. 
I mean, there are so many different wild varieties of honeybees or bees that are wild. Um, I don't know exactly where they are on that list, but in talking to all different beekeepers and friends, the amount of hives that are dying from bees getting into pesticide is so high. And when I mean pesticides, I mean farms, big scale and small home farms that are spraying Roundup, any chemicals on farms where all of these pollinators, all these different varieties are bee, of bees are going into them. They can't get back to their hive or wherever they live because they're, they're lost really and then they die. Um, the majority of beekeepers you talk to, everyone seems to always lose a hive that way. They find all their bees dead. Um, so I don't really know the statistics right now of, you know, for all the different varieties of bees, but I do, do know that I think it's the um, two of the bumblebees are on the extinct list or close to extinct in Vermont. And that's just like the common bumblebee um, that you would see out, like big fat bee, black stripe, you know, like, um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Or It is, it is seven o'clock. Um, if folks don't mind sticking around for another question or two, um, uh, how? Okay, let's let's have a couple more questions. Yeah. <laughs> another bee question for Ariel. Um, we have eight or ten acres that we only mow a couple times a year, so there's plenty of things for the pollinators. But uh, normally when I'm mowing our lawn, we have a couple acres of lawn, I stop for the bees. Bumblebees don't like, they aren't intimidated by lawn mower, so they'll sit there and not get out of the way. But my question is, I haven't seen a single bee this spring. Is it too early? I haven't seen any kind of a bee. No bees at all? Nothing? Wow. Um, well, I know where I live, it was snowing yesterday and there was a hard frost and the bees at my house in the, I have top bar hives, they, they need sun to come out. They were not coming out like yesterday, they didn't come out. This morning when I left, they didn't come out. It was just cold. But um, if you're not mowing very much and you're usually seeing bees, that's a little bit surprising to me because right now everything is opening. The dandelions should get them out, the apple trees, all everything is going full on right now, so this is when we should be seeing them. Um, yeah, that's concerning, but good for you for not mowing for a while because that's what bees need. They need all of those natural things to pollinate, so yeah. Thank you. I have a question for Jonah. Um, you were talking a lot about like 40 plus people coming and helping you with moves and things, and I just wanted to hear more about um, how do you build community as a farmer? And is it across the state? Is it really local? And just how do you meet other people who want to help out? Um, yeah, in, that, in those cases, those were just friends or friends of friends. I mean, my wife and I have lived in our community for over 10 years. She's been there longer than I have, actually. Um, so we're, we're pretty rooted and pretty connected, and I think that we have like a cool, we have a reputation in our community as being like a cool farm that people want to, <laughs> people want to hang out at and, and get to know us and be a part of. Um, and so I think that certainly helps not to like toot my own horn, but I think it's just kind of, that's, it's just what's happening um, for us. Um, we also like to think about our farm as not just like a site where we're growing food, but also as a place where we can host community events, work days, bring people in that way that we might not otherwise connect with. We've certainly um, made friends that way. Um, a lot of folks are queer and some folks are not. Um, 
yeah, I guess those are kind of some of the ways that we that we build community. And now that we have our 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 forever farm, which is um, just like the best thing ever to say, we um <coughs> yeah, we just want to go deeper with that and hold more events and educational stuff for folks um, to come and and really see what it means to get your fingers in the dirt. This question is from James, and it is to Ariel or Jonah. In terms of access to land for underrepresented farmers, do you feel like there are resources, there are resources or support? Um, I have a lot to say about this topic. Um, our journey to farm, uh, our long-term <coughs> situation on our farm was really rocky and difficult, um, kind of actually regardless of being queer or not, we were farming for many years, had a sustainable, profitable business, we had good credit, we had good income, um, and yet when it came time to find land that we could afford, it was nearly impossible to the point where we almost, we came this close to, um, to quitting farming and walking away from it all um, because we had a lease on a short term um, with a short term landlord that ended kind of abruptly and surprisingly and we desperately needed to find a place to be. Um, so uh <coughs> where we farm now, we actually don't own our land. Um, we have a kind of a non-traditional approach to our land access. We have a lifetime lease on 10 acres owned by a small community land trust called the Earthbridge Community Land Trust. And I also just real quick want to give a shout out to Linda Smith, who's in the room here, who if you don't know her, she uh, was the farmer for 30 years on our piece of land before we got it, and she lives here in Montpelier now. So huge, we owe her a huge uh, debt of gratitude. Immense, immense thanks. Um, but um, in terms of like resources, um, because our, because our, uh, because we didn't, when we, when we went to buy our farm, we actually needed a, we got caught in this weird loophole where we actually needed a home construction loan, but because we didn't own the land that the house was on, no local institution, bank, credit union, nothing would work with us, nor would the farm service agency, which is like the gold standard for young farmers getting farm loans. They said no, which much to our dismay and shock. So we ended up getting a loan um, ultimately to finance our farm, which was a shorter term and a much higher interest rate than we really wanted. But that was that was what we had to do, and that's what we're looking at. Um, so in terms of like resources, I mean, there are grants out there. There's some funding. The I'll give a shout out to the Intervale Center, who does business coaching and support for farm businesses, they were a huge help. They offered us some legal support when we were transitioning and going through the process of buying our, buying our farm and working with the land trust, which took actually like most of a year to do. Um, there's the Legal Food Hub here in Vermont, which is a project of the Vermont Law School, I believe. They offer pro bono um, legal services for farmers so that, that we worked with, um, we had an attorney through them which was a huge support because um, otherwise we would just have had massive <laughs> legal fees to get through all of the red tape and buying our farm. Um, yeah, like I said, there are some grants out there, but like kind of like what you were saying, Ariel, if you don't have the time or if you don't know about the grants or if you're not grant savvy, you don't know the language, you don't know the grant systems, you don't know how to like massage those networks or work that world, then those aren't really going to be available to you. Um, we have received a bunch of grants this year. We got just under the radar as like young farmers and we got a grant from the National Young Farmer Association slash Chipotle, which gave us a $5,000 grant to help us build a barn. Um, yeah, weird. I've never even set foot in a Chipotle. Um, but so yeah, there's some resources out there, but honestly not enough. And really it's kind of less about the resources and more that, so we live in, 
Vermont, we're an agricultural state, and the problem is not actually a lack of land. There's land everywhere. Look around. It's here. The problem is access to land and that people are hoarding land and that people who want to invite farmers onto their land to rent or to lease don't know what they're doing and don't know how to be like compassionate, kind, and considerate of what farmers' needs actually are. So if you're a landowner and you're thinking about, hmm, maybe I want to like give out eight or ten acres to somebody who wants to start a business or run their farm out here, like you should talk to um, Land for Good. They have really good resources for folks who are trying to do that to kind of educate yourself um, so that the farmer can be protected, so that the landowner can also be protected. Because um, there's just, I just heard, you know, myself included two times over, and there's just way too many young farmers and other farmers out there who have been burned um, in those kinds of uh, situations. And it's emotionally draining and like, it's bad for your business, it's bad for your community, it's bad for, um, it's just bad energy all around. Hope that answered the question. Um, I guess I could say just to not give up hope. I had a different experience. It was like a lot of searching and when I found a piece of land, I actually wrote the landowners a handwritten letter and said, this is what we want to do on the land. This is who we are, like kind of old school. And it totally worked. And they were like, all right, you know, and we like built our home and like built business and we're taking care of the land. And so I would say like, don't give up hope. You never know. There's so many incredible people out there who have land and they want it to just go to the right people and not have it be developed. And they would love to see young people or any age people do good things on it. So I would say to that person, you know, you never know. You might just find something you really want and just like go for it. And also NOFA um, in every state is an amazing resource for any business. I would say to reach out to them, look at online, they have like a classified list that you can post what you're looking for, or people post what they, you know, what they have. Um, so yeah, those are mine. Um, I we're going to take one more question and then wrap up. But I want to remind everybody that on each table is an exit form uh, with some questions to help the co-op evaluate how this event went. So please, if you have a moment, fill those out. Okay, so the exit surveys will, you can, they'll be collected over here. And then there's also food you can take home. There's extra food. So let's take one more question, everybody. Um, Shonda Williams, the Vermont Kindness Project and JEDI committee member. Um, so I just want to ask the BIPOC farmers um, and business owners, did you have white allies helping you? Um, because uh, I just do want to mention that um, here there is a lot of white supremacy and white privilege, um, especially, you know, you get uh, a hand up helping you uh, to go further in your business than you would if you were a BIPOC person. Did any uh, white allies show up for you? And I also want to put it out to the co-op. What is the co-op doing to help small uh, business owners such as these? In my experience, um, as um, um, I feel like, honestly, I in this industry have been kind of like tokenized a lot, quite often, and like used as kind of a bit of like a poster child person um, in the cannabis industry. 
by the state of Vermont, by um, media in the state of Vermont, by um, people like calling me and asking me information and gleaning information uh, from me. Um, so I don't feel like I, um, I don't feel like I've been felt that much allyship, honestly, uh, as a person of color in Vermont. <laughs> but this was nice. This 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 event, I don't feel that way about. <laughs> Just so everyone knows. But but I have historically that's been something that I've felt. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, my experience, uh, I found it felt like a mixed um, situation for me. So, um, I feel like, you know, when I, sorry, Dad, you can't hear me yet, sorry. So, when we first started out, um, oh, yeah, I think it's because of that, yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's going to stand up. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like it's kind of like a mixed experience for me. Uh, so um, when I first started out, um, there were you know not a lot of help. You know, uh, seriously. You know, as a and I, what I mentioned earlier about you know uh, new startup folks you know needing help. Uh, every startup you know anyone you know needs help. But you know I feel like BIPOC and minority people need extra extra help because they have not a lot of connections, not a lot of network to tap into. And you know, especially us, you know, we moved here from New York. So on top of that, you know, we had we didn't know anybody, we had no network, no connections, no you know anything. So it was even tougher for us. But I, I understand what you're saying. You know, there's sometimes you know, we feel like, uh, especially you know, when we were first starting out, we felt like we were kind of looked down upon. You know, um, as an you know, Asian person, you know, when they see uh, you know uh, an Asian person starting a business and they're trying to go into a bank or you know get a loan or even trying to get a meeting, you know, uh, you know, you don't get that as fast as if you would you know been a different person, I guess, you know, uh, different background. So there were a lot of challenges, but at the same time, you know, I also, also had a, a lot of great allies. Uh, you know, some folks from USDA, you know, uh, that helped me understand, you know, all these permits, the regulations, you know, the HACCP, you know, all of these things. And uh, what I mentioned earlier about, you know, if I had started in New York, you know, they wouldn't have given me a time of the day, you know. They would be just hanging up on me constantly. And I was calling the folks here at, you know, the Vermont DA, you know, hey, I don't know what this is, can you help me? And they took my calls, you know, they took time to answer my, you know, questions and stuff like that. So it's a very mixed, you know, uh, scenario for me. And again, it's only my personal feelings, but again, you know, in general, I know there's there's a lot of, you know, challenges uh, for being BIPOC, you know, minority uh, people starting a business. Um, and especially uh, what I mentioned earlier about funding, it, it's really tough, you know, I mean, uh, Starting out is tough, you know, but without having any kind of funding available to you, it's even worse because, you know, people al always want to associate with you or, you know, help you if you're successful, if you already have s some kind of background, you know. If you don't have anything, then they don't want to give you any money. <laughs> they don't want to give you, f you know, any funding. Uh, you know, so it's kind of, I mean, if you don't have funding, you, know, you can't start out, right? And if you don't... If there's not a place you know, or somewhere that you can start out, then you know you're not going to get to step two, step three, you know, uh, and so on. So you know those are the the main challenges that I saw, um, uh, mainly you know uh, in, in the funding, and uh, as a community as a whole, you know, again, you know, there's sometimes you know you feel like you've been ignored or you know kind of like pushed away and you know not given the most priority, you know. But, you know, uh, you just got to persevere, I guess. You just keep going, just, you know, just keep chugging along and do the best you can and hope for the best, I guess, and, you know, work hard. Yeah. Thank you.
This is from Hazel. And she says, we're a small African-American farm in year two, the Flying Buffalo. The co-op has assisted us with a small grant this year toward the purchase of a tunnel, really helpful. Would be great eventually to be able to sell to the co-op, but the really big issue is land access and land ownership from an African-American perspective. Allies can be really helpful to build with. Okay, we're going to pass it to Elaine. Yeah, I'm just going oh. to introduce Elaine. Elaine is um, a member of the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, and she is going to um, offer a closing statement for, uh, for the evening. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, I hope this isn't too, like, <laughs> everybody hear me? Thank you so much for coming tonight, and um, it's so wonderful to see everyone who came out, and this food was absolutely delicious. Thank you to Rowan. I just want to say thank you to Jonah for bringing those salad greens. Thank you. The salad greens were absolutely delicious, too. <laughs> thank you. And especially, especially to our presenters. I, I learned so much and just want to give you another round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and for everything you do every day, it's, it's such hard work. And we, all of our stomachs really appreciate every bit of it. Um, I have just a quick quote from um, an amazing author and activist in addition to being the wife of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And she said, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. So just as a short and, short and sweet goodbye, um, let's all continue to compassionately help each other out. And thank you for being here. <laughs>